All right, welcome. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to the STI Clinical Update Webinar, California MPOX Update for Healthcare Providers. Um, my name is Dr. Eric Tang. I'm the Chief of the Medical and Scientific Affairs Section and MPOX Lead with the Sexually Transmitted Diseases Control Branch at the California Department of Public Health. And I'll be emceeing today's webinar and going over some introductory slides. A little bit more about the California Prevention Training Center. So the California uh, Prevention Training Center, PTC, is a multidisciplinary training and capacity building assistance center. SDI clinical training is sponsored by the CDC, and we are members of the National Network of SD Clinical uh, Prevention Training Centers, or the NNPTC. SDI clinical training provides virtual and in-person training events, technical assistance, clinical tools and STI clinical consultation services focusing on complex STI issues in patient care. You can learn more about STI clinical training at the California Prevention Training Center and the NNPTC by visiting the web pages listed on the slide. So the CAPTC also runs the SD Clinical Consultation Network, SDCCN, for our region. This is an online clinical consultation network where providers can submit complex STI uh, questions and a subject matter expert will apply either by phone or email per your request within one to five business days. Here is our financial disclosures, which um, we have nothing to disclose. And here's our CME disclosure stating that today's webinar is offering uh, 1.5 units. To earn one half units for today's webinar, you have, um, have to have registered for the webinar on uh, the NNPTC website by October 25th, 2023 um, by 3 p.m. So please note that registration has closed. Um, you need to stick with us for the full webinar today by watching it live and in full. Attendance is recorded during um, the webinar, and we are unable to provide CME credit for viewing and webinar recording. Uh, you must complete the post-course survey evaluation by November 3rd, 2023. Um, registrants will receive the link to the survey 24 hours after the webinar from training at nnptc.org to the email address you use to register with on NNPTC. To ensure you receive the notification, please, please add training at nnptc.org uh, to your safe and trusted uh, centers list and be sure to check your spam and junk folders if you do not see the notification in your inbox. Um, also at the uh, conclusion of this webinar, we will be posting a link to a clinic assessment survey um, regarding MPOX needs, which is separate and optional from um, the CME requirements. Um, So if you meet the above CME requirements, uh, you will receive the CMA notification on or before December 7th um, from CAPTC at ucsf.edu to the email address to use to register with on NMPTC. Um, the notification will include a claim link to obtain your certificate through our CME provider, University of Nevada, Reno School of Medicine. Um, to ensure you receive a notification, please add CAPTC at ucsf.edu to your safe and trusted senders list and be sure to check your uh, spam and junk folders if you not see uh, the email in your inbox. So um, please monitor your email inbox for the post webinar materials notification, um, which is emailed to all registrants two weeks after the webinar. The email notification will include a copy of the slide handout and link to the webinar recordings. All registrants must, uh, will receive the notification and you do not need to request these materials separately. Again, to ensure you receive the email notification, please add CAPTC at ucsf.edu to your safe and trusted senders list and be sure to check your spam folders if you do not see the notification in your main inbox. A couple of quick housekeeping notes about Zoom. The Q&A will be turned on for attendees. Microphone, uh, microphone, video, and chat will be turned off for attendees. Only presenters will have access to the microphone and video. Um, to use the Q&A, uh, click on the Q&A icon as seen here on the slide, which will be in the bottom of your Zoom screen. Once you click on the Q&A icon, you can type in your question and click send to submit. If you want to send anonymously, then you select anonymous. 
You can submit questions up until the last two minutes of the Q&A section. Um, also, uh, during the webinar, um, I'll be reviewing the Q&A and may answer your questions directly, or they may be answered uh, live during the question and answer. You can also submit your administrative questions into the Q&A as well, and they will be answered by our clinical admin team. If you have any questions, you can reach out to Elizabeth Olson, who is the CAPTC Clinical Program Manager. Her email address is shown here, elizabeth.olson at ucsf.edu. And now I'd like to introduce our speakers for today's webinar, Kayla Sada and Dr. Jessica Watson. Kayla Sada is a senior epidemiologist and the MPOX epidemiology unit lead at the SD control branch of the California Department of Public Health. She obtained her master of public health from the George Washington University and uh, has previously worked on uh, as an epidemiologist at various levels of government on HPV and cervical cancer and COVID-19. Her research interests include structural and social barriers to sexual health and creating equitable access to sexual health prevention activities. Dr. Jessica Watson is a public health medical officer for MPOX, the STD control branch of the California Department of Public Health. She is internal and preventive medicine trained from Kaiser San Francisco and University of California, San Francisco with a master's degree in public health and epidemiology. Her past work and research have focused on global population health and chronic disease disparities. Her recent research has been on MPOX and programmatic interests include addressing MPOX holistically um, as a syndemic approach. And with that, I will hand over uh, the uh, screen to uh, Kayla um, for her to begin her presentation. Thanks, Eric. Um, let me go ahead and, um, I think you need to stop sharing. There we go. Okay. Um, thank you, Eric, for the introduction. Um, today we'll be talking about an MPOX update for healthcare providers in California. So I'll be starting with an epidemiology overview and then I'll pass it over to um, Jessica. So um, MPOX um, is caused by a virus and it's not a new infection, but it previously was rare. So it's caused by orthopox virus and it's related to smallpox. It's generally much less severe than smallpox. It was endemic in some parts of the world, so West and Central Africa. And MPOX cases in non-endemic countries have occurred sporadically over time and they've previously been linked to international travel or imported animals. Um, the natural reservoir is unknown, possibly rodents or non-human primates. And since May of 2022, MPOX um, started outbreaking here in the US um, and other countries throughout the world. So looking at the estimated global burden of MPOX, globally, there's been about 90,000 confirmed cases as of October 11th. In 115 countries, there's been 161 deaths reported. Looking more specifically at the United States, there's been 30,861 cases, that was as of the end of September, in 52 states, territories, and districts, and there's been 54 confirmed deaths in the United States due to MPOX. So looking at California specifically, as of October 16th, the burden of MPOX in California increased with 22 new cases reported compared to 18 reported in the previous week. Um, and cases were reported in 10 counties throughout California. So we've definitely been starting to see an increase in cases over the past several weeks um, and in counties throughout every region of California. In the past three weeks, there's been an 83% increase in MPOX cases compared to the previous three week period. In the month of September, there was an average of 12 cases per week and that's compared to about seven cases in July and August. And we've seen those increases continue into October. Cases do continue to remain low compared to the same time period in 2022. We also are seeing detections continue in wastewater throughout the state in almost every region of California. Testing continues to remain very low for MPOX. 
um, throughout the state of California. And we've been seeing test positivity increase over the past several weeks from approximately 10% in July and August up to about 25% in September and early October. There have also been rising cases in other parts of the US. So in October, uh, Kings County in Seattle put out a press release about rising cases. There's also been increases seen in North Carolina and in Hawaii, and they've put out um, press releases as well related to those increases. And this is an epi curve looking at the past 90 days. So a date range of July 18th to October 17th. We've seen 121 confirmed or probable cases, an average of about 2.2 cases per day, and we've seen five hospitalizations in that time period. And this is a look at test positivity. So testing, as I said in the summary, remains very low in California. We're seeing about 100 tests performed per week in California, um, which is obviously very low. So we're seeing test positivity increasing to about 20 to 25% over the past several weeks. Um, and that has con continued in um, the past few weeks of October as well. And this is a look at wastewater detections. Um, so we've had intermittent detections at 10 sites. This was from last week, but looking at data that we just saw, it's actually up to about 20 sites now. Um, so we're seeing widespread wastewater detection in almost all regions in California as well, um, going along with this case increase that we've been seeing. So with low testing, a high test positivity rate and wastewater detections more widespread than cases, this all suggests that there is ongoing undetected MPOX transmission occurring in California, largely probably due to low testing. Um, a lot of that is still going undetected. And um, looking at disproportionate cases by race ethnicity. So you can see here, uh, the purple bar are our cases and the gray bar is total population. So we're seeing a disproportionate impact on persons who are identifying as black or African-American or Latinx. And we also see um, disparities here looking at vaccination rates. So again, the purple is the percent of cases and the gray is the percent vaccinated. So we can see that these same populations are overrepresented in our cases and they're underrepresented in um, who has been vaccinated so far. So now I'm gonna toss it over to Jess for the clinical overview. Thanks, Kayla, and nice to be here with everyone today. Um, as a warning, there will be clinical pictures forthcoming in case you're in a public area, please plan accordingly. Um, some of the photos may actually be reviewed for you, but um, they're really the best examples we've seen um, for level setting today. And I will throw out there right now at the beginning of the talk, always happy to receive more clinical photos if folks want to share with me after the presentation. So impacts recognition, diagnosis, treatment, and prevention basics. These are the four tenets we'll talk about today. Um, Kayla and I are going to give a detailed overview of MPOX, which is perfectly timed with the rising cases we're seeing across the state. Um, we'll start with recognition, the epi risk factors, impox rash lookalikes, and some severe manifestations. Um, diagnosis, including a video of how to test for impox in the clinic. And we'll do a treatment overview about how you can access TPOX through a clinical trial called STOMP, as well as through the state warehouse um, stores. And we'll finish with research updates on vaccination and Genius um, vaccine. Next slide, please. And again, we're gonna start off with a poll and um, I'm gonna open the poll for me and Kayla. Since it's all three, um, we can click through the boxes here. So question number one, which pictured rash lesion do you think is MPOX for the three on the left for the pustular rash? Is it A? B or C. Question number two, out of the vesicular rash here, which do you think is MPOX, A or B? Oh, it actually didn't come across that way on our questions. It says all of the above or none of the above. Um, so maybe all of the above can be A. And for question number one, the bottom would be B. 
B or C, you could clue those together. For question number two, if you think the vesicular rash, rash of impox is A, you can click all of the above. If you think it's B, you can click none of the above. And for question number three, the oral lesion, if you think MPOX is A, you can click all of the above. If you think it's B, none of the above. Uh, sorry, the poll didn't come across. We'll give you a minute to answer that. And you can close the poll. We'll just talk about this as I think it kind of came across confusing. Are we able to see the results of the poll? Yeah, they're they're being shared right now. Um, should be able to see them. Um, question one, the top was seventy five percent. Question two had a fifty six percent majority on all the above. And for question three, uh, none of the above was the winner. Okay. Um, great. Thank you. Perfect. So. Um, this was my my attempt to uh, show us all that it is impacts is mimicking other diseases, and I think the responses actually do highlight that. So we'll go through them. For A, we'll focus on the left. Um, or for question one, A is actually molluscum, and the bottom two pictures are impacts. So as you can see here, it's looking quite similar. Um, so molluscum can be painless, localized, firm, dome shaped. Um, umbilicated papules, the top picture, but impox on the bottom is also well circumcised with umbilication. It is um, usually painful, but has been described as painless. Um, so it doesn't take it off the differential if someone's having a painless lesion and um, can be found on any body part, as you'll see uh, on the palms there in picture B. This can also look very similar to varicella. For our center pictures here with the fascicular rash, um, the correct answer was A for MPOX, B is herpes virus. Um, so FYI that herpes one and two are common ulcerative lesions like MPOX symptoms can be mild, mistaken for other conditions, um, sometimes even ingrown hairs. MPOX has been described as solitary vesicles that are regionally distributed and they may or may not be painful again. Um, initially, vesicles are small with no central umbilication, so representing the similarity to herpes in that central picture. And moving on to the right, the third oral lesion, the correct answer was A. So a thin-roofed white pustule on an erythematous base, typically painful. That is an impox picture, while B is an aphthous ulcer, so also painful, a white mucus patch or white erosion. Very, very similar appearing. Um, so on the slide, big takeaway, and you can click once, Kayla, the early macular rash of impasse can look um, like many things, um, like a mimic or just like secondary syphilis, ulcers, papules, crusted skin lesions of impox appear like herpes, and impox ulcers on genitals or other sites can appear like primary syphilis or vice versa. Um, so the typical stages of impox are macules, papul papules, vesicles, pustulars, pustules to scabs, um, but you don't know where you are along the stages and might see this at any time. Um, so you need to test to confirm diagnosis or rule out diagnosis concurrently. Next slide, please. Um, thank you. And we'll do one other case presentation with a poll on the next slide. So let's say today a 35-year-old MSM male presents to your clinic. He's on HIV PrEP and gets his STI testing monthly. He reports he's sexually active with one stable partner and one new partner in the last month. He has a history of MPOX vaccination um, in August, 2022 with a two dose series. So considered fully vaccinated. His genital exam reveals the following. Next slide. And you can click again. And special thanks to OC Health and Dr. Christopher Reed for sharing this photo with uh, Dr. Kelly Johnson in the past. And the poll is now open. What do you want to test for? Genital herpes, primary syphilis, MPOX, LGV, or all the above? Okay.
And I think we could close the poll. Let's see if it. Hmm. Oh, perfect. I can see it this time. All of the above. Great. Um, perfect. So that's great. Um, if you're anything like me, it would drive me crazy to not know the diagnosis from the picture. So to curb your curiosity, this was an MPOX case. Um, but the main takeaway is that MPOX is mimicking many diseases and STI. So even if you think you can tell them apart on exam, you should test for MPOX and STI co-infections. We can go to the next slide. So you'll see on the quote on the right here, high prevalence of STIs, including gonorrhea, chlamydia, syphilis, and HIV co-infections have been reported in the 2022 MPOX outbreak. Um, MPOX infections can happen despite vaccination or past infection with MPOX, like our person in the case. Concurrent STIs are common. So even if it's MPOX, um, that is the rash you're seeing, other STIs may be there as well. If an MPOX diagnosis is made and HIV or other STIs haven't been tested for, test for them. And if HIV negative, it's a good time to offer PrEP or consider this discussion with your patients. Next slide, please. So taking a step back, um, from our interactive cases, um, how is MPOX spreading? The most common routes of transmission have involved direct contact with body fluids or lesions, primarily through close personal skin-to-skin -skin contact, as you'll see on the left in the orange there. However, transmission from contact with fomites and exposure to respiratory secretions with prolonged face-to-face -face contact are possible, but less common. Prolonged um, Face-to-face -face contact has been noted to be six feet for three hours for the CDC. As Kayla has presented, the most common groups affected to date are men um, who identify as gay, bisexual, or other men who have sex with men. However, anyone that is exposed to MPOX can get MPOX. Epi criteria includes those with likely or possible exposure within the incubation period of up to 21 days, um, which includes known likely exposure, close intimate contact, and social networks experience MPOX activity, and still also on the definition mentions travels or animals, although this has been less of a concern lately. Next slide. A research update. Um, our own group at CDPH and UC Berkeley did a joint study which has shown that individuals without visibly prominent symptoms can transmit infections. Research on asymptomatic and presymptomatic transmission is still underway. The CDC reports that patients have transmitted MPOX for up to four days prior to symptom onset, meaning cases won't know if they have MPOX and partners won't see signs and symptoms, but can still acquire disease. Our team in collaboration with UC Berkeley re recently published a study in the Journal of Infectious Diseases using case control study data that showed only three out of 54 cases, so 5.6%, reported that their sexual partner with whom they had contact with within the 20 way, 21 days of symptom onset had symptoms visible to participants during sex. While participants' assessment of symptoms and partners may be imperfect, the study um, done primar is primarily done through recall and it's possible more partners have symptoms, but it's also possible that MPOX is spreading through asymptomatic contact. These findings suggest individuals without prominently visible MPOX symptoms can transmit infection, which is important for messaging to our patients and community. Um, next slide, please. And you can click again. So let's review what will people with MPOX present with. As mentioned, the incubation period is up to 21 days. However, not all patients will be forthcoming with their exposures within 24 days. Typical symptoms um, last um, from two to four weeks with prodromal symptoms, flu-like symptoms as noted here, um, starting and then being followed by a characteristic rash. This is the typical presentation, but as I'll talk about more today, not quite what we're seeing in this outbreak. So um, the typical textbook clinical features include flu-like symptoms followed by rash. The rash can progress from macules, papules, vesicles, pustules to scabs. But as mentioned, 
MPOX may present atypically with subtle or mild symptoms, and clinical presentation may depend on vaccine status or stage of lesion. Um, we're definitely learning more as um, more people are vaccinated, how that affects their presentation. Next slide. So on the right here, um, as classic MPOX has included fever, flu-like symptoms, lymphadenopathy, atypical um, MPOX, which is many of the current cases, may have no prodrome or, or even systemic symptoms after rash. Um, while classic MPOX was noted to be umbilicated rash, um, the MPOX in the current outbreak is actually mimicking many other STIs. And while classic MPOX may have lesions of similar size and stages, um, the MPOX in the current outbreak, you can have lesions at different stages present at the same time. We're seeing rashes um, that can be on all body parts, including genital areas, while in the past, classic MPOX may have been on the mouth, face, and extremities. And in the current outbreak, we're also seeing um, Proctitis, so not clear rashes in areas where you may not be able to determine. So physical exam is very important. Next slide, please. Here's the progression of classic MPOX. As you'll see, the macules on the left to papules, to vesicles, pustules, and scabs. And I think we've gone over this in detail now. We can go to the next slide. Here's more typical genital lesions. So you'll see the umbilicated rash in the center and the scabbing of a rash on the right. And next slide. Here's what was known as less typical um, genital lesions. The middle photo is from our case. Um, and as you've seen before, the antidote shared with this, um, which may be a repeat to some from the last CalPTC webinar, but I think a great example of the mimickers we're seeing um, from Orange County STD controller stated, I would have bet my retirement that this was syphilis. He actually had a biopsy done, which was negative for trypanome um, done by a dermatologist. Plus his serology was negative. Those sores were indurated, but not painful. Quite bizarre. Next slide. Impact skin lesions can involve palms, soles, and face as seen here. And next. And it can also involve mucosal areas as we saw in our name that disease as well. Um, so all of this reiterating the need for a thorough physical exam. Moving on to severe manifestations. So that was an overarching review of what you're more likely to see in outpatient clinic, but just to note that impacts can progress beyond a simple flu and rash. While most impacts cases have been mild to moderate and self-limited, hospitalizations, the need for ICU level care, and even deaths have occurred. The potential for severe disease is an increased among immunocompromised, and the CDC considers higher risk for those with HIV and a CD4 count less than 350. There's an especial risk of severe disease and, and death for those with CD4 counts below 200. Severe manifestations are broad and varied, but affect all body systems, it can involve superimposed bacterial infections that present quite advanced and may delay a diagnosis of MPOX as it can look like other things. So it's important to consider in all patients, but especially patients with immunocompromise. So manifestations have included oropharyngeal or bowel involvement, cardiac complications, lymphadenopathy, ocular complications, including site-threatening disease, strictures, Phimosis, and a bit more rare, but CNS involvement. Next slide. So to touch on MPOX and HIV, persons with HIV who acquire MPOX are more likely to experience severe disease or even death. Undiagnosed or uncontrolled HIV puts patients at risk for severe disease, leading to prolonged pain and suffering. Immunocompromise at the time of diagnosis has been the largest risk factor for death from MPOX. Among 38 MPOX-related deaths in the United States, about 94% of those with available HIV status had HIV infection. And among 24 deaths with HIV and available data, all had CD4 counts less than 200. 96% um, of those had CD4 counts less than 50. 
Now, this is just showing that equitable and early access to prevention and treatment for both MPOX and HIV is critical to reducing MPOX related mortality. MPOX vaccination works very well at preventing severe diseases and is crucial in this population. We have had no two dose vaccinated persons with HIV hospitalized in California, as one of our um, MMWRs co um, published with CDC has shown. But vaccine coverage among HIV people is below 30% across California, so an area that needs to be highly prioritized. Next slide, please. Here's a case of a patient with MPOX and HIV. So thank you again to Dr. Oliver Bacon for sharing this photo with CDPH. This is an example of a patient with HIV and a CD4 count of 20, viral load of 58,000 and not on ART. In many cases, oh, sorry, here you can see severe anal lesions and proctitis. In many cases, we've seen the need for prolonged uh, weeks to months of TPOX treatment while patients are co-treated for HIV and their immune system restored. Not speaking to this case, but we have seen that both the failure to recognize lesions as progressive MPOX and delayed HIV diagnosis can contribute to severity of disease. As mentioned, current guidelines advise screening for STIs and HIV offered to all sexually active patients who have MPOX to aid in early diagnosis and treatment. Earlier ART initiation will benefit patients. Finally, the CDPH clinical team is available for consultation in any scenario, including difficult or prolonged cases. Um, and clinicians caring for patients who have persistent MPOX should evaluate for underlying immunodeficiency particularly HIV, and consider the possibility of antiviral resistance in cases that fail to respond to standard care. We're always happy to consult on these cases. Next slide, please. There's some additional pictures of advanced disease. Um, thank you to Alexandra Dretler for sharing these photos with CDPH. And next slide. Okay, so shifting gears to MPOX diagnosis, testing, and healthcare provider safety. You can go to the next slide. Um, so uh, to mimic what I've been saying today, we really want you to keep MPOX on your differential and test with any suspicion. Please consider testing for any rash in an appropriate population, or if your differential diagnosis includes herpes, varicella, syphilis, et cetera. If MPOX is on your differential, wear appropriate PPE. This includes a gown, gloves, eye protection, and NIOSH approved particulate respirator equipped with an N95 filter. Um, we're gonna show you a video on um, testing for MPOX. The collection procedure may be painful for the patient and may cause them to react by pulling away from the swab. Avoid this by informing the patient on what to expect. Perform hand hygiene before beginning the procedure. Remove the swab from the wrapper. Hold the swab firmly to maintain control while rubbing. Vigorously rub and rotate the tip of the swab over the lesion and surrounding skin. Deroofing the lesion may occur. A sterile gauze pad may be needed to contain fluid that may flow from the lesion during and after collection. For lesions that do not appear to have a pocket of fluid or for dry lesions, collect the sample in the same manner as with a wet lesion. Rub vigorously on the top and around the lesion. Deroofing may occur, but is not necessary as viral DNA is present in and around the lesion. The current recommendation is to collect two separate swabs per lesion and swab two different lesions, preferably in different areas, for a total of four swabs. As new resources are made available, guidance may change in regards to type of sampling and collection details. 
so it is recommended that you check with your current testing site for more information. Great, thank you, Kayla. Perfect, so just went over this, but I felt really useful um, to see it happen live for anyone who hasn't had an inbox case. Um, testing is simple, easy, and hopefully accessible um, to everyone at this point, available at many public, at all public health and commercial labs, or many. Um, turnaround time these days is one to five days, and we'd love to hear if you had any trouble accessing MPOX testing. Um, so as the video showed, um, swabbing for, oh, can you go back one? Thanks. Swabbing for orthopox, MPOX, PCR, wear the appropriate PPE. Um, use sterile dry synthetic swabs to collect two swabs from each lesion, preferably from different locations or lesions with different appearances. Vigorously swab the lesion to collect adequate DNA. You do not have to de-roof the lesion, but that may happen in practice. Um, please place each swab in a sterile container and the um, shipping conditions may vary depending on testing lab. So please reach out to your lab to find out specific details. Next slide, please. Um, so a reminder on donning doffing PPE, just want to bring attention that this resource is available um, from the CDC. So for gown, goggles, gloves, and mask, how to properly place and remove um, PPE. Some doffing highlights, importantly, hand hygiene should be performed between steps if hands become contaminated and immediately after removing all PPE. Sessional use of PPE is not appropriate when caring for MPOX patients and all PPE must be changed between patient encounters. If appropriate PPE is not available for you, please speak with your clinic manager to obtain such before seeing any patient suspect for MPOX. Um, and access to this information can be found at the link below. Next slide, please. If um, you are a healthcare provider and worried about exposure to MPOX, of course, speak with your ID specialist or local health department for guidance and shared decision making. Any healthcare provider with an MPOX exposure should monitor for 21 days for symptoms. If the healthcare provider has a high risk exposure, PEP should be recommended. CDC has a um, table to the right here, which documents which exposures may be thought of as higher risk versus intermediate versus lower. If intermediate risk exposure, PEP could be considered. And again, you would talk to your ID specialist or local health department for shared decision-making. Next slide, please. And now finally shifting for my part to MPOX therapeutics before vaccination. Next slide. How to manage someone with MPOX. So as mentioned, in most cases, MPOX is self-limited and supportive care may be the only thing that's needed. For general pain, just general pain management of NSAIDs, acetaminophen if appropriate. More severe cases, the recommendations are to consider gabapentin or short course of opiates. Topical lidocaine or steroids could be used, um, but this would need to be applied and reminded to patients to apply with gloves and hand washing in between. For proctitis, you can consider stool softeners and warm sits baths. For oropharyngeal lesions, saltwater rinses, oral antiseptics, local anesthetics such as lidocaine and magic mouthwash, and for puritis, oral antihistamines, and topicals, again, you would need to recommend gloves and frequent hand washing. Um, and the CDC and CDPH has more recommendations on their pages, which we'll share the slides after the presentation with these links. Next slide. Um, so when to consider advanced therapeutics. Um, so advanced therapeutics can be TPOX, uh, IVIG, brinsidofavir, um, and it's really for, some of these are for people with severe disease and I will go over the differentiation of when TPOX is available for mild disease through the STOMP trial. But classically, we use these medications for severe disease or people that have involvement of anatomical areas that might result in serious sequelae. Um, that includes scarring or strictures. Um, 
And then of course, people that are at risk for severe disease, such as those experiencing immunocompromised, pediatric populations, which is currently listed as patients under them one, under the age of one, pregnant or breastfeeding people, or people with conditions that affect skin integrity, such as atopic dermatitis, eczema, psoriasis, and pitigo, um, HSV or VCV. Um, we'll go over more about the differentiation uh, for TPOX on the next slides. And if you are considering um, advanced therapeutics beyond TPOX, so IV TPOX, IVIG, or the Sadafavirs, um, CDPH is interested in hearing about severe cases, and CDC and CDPH are available for consults and, and many times are necessary for accessing those medications. Next slide. So TPOX. TPOX is our uh, first line antiviral treatment um, for MPOX. There's two ways to get TPOX right now. The first line preferred method is the STOMP trial. The STOMP trial um, is the clinical trial of oral TPOX safety and efficacy. Um, patients must now be ineligible or decline STOMP to obtain TPOX um, through the CDC IND, um, which also equivalent equivalence is the equivalent to the state warehouse. Um, so enrollment is critical to show TPOX efficacy for possible FDA approval and commercial availability. Um, please note that STOMP is enrolling individuals with mild disease, unlike the CDC IND, and anyone that meets eligibility criteria can be involved. So as a reminder, the CDC IND requirements um, which is also required to access state supplies, requires patients to have severe disease or involvement of anatomical areas that might result in serious sequelae or at risk for high disease um, progression. So going back to STOMP, the trial includes a placebo-controlled randomized arm and an open-label option for um, patients with severe disease. So they will call and talk to patients and determine which arm of the study they should go in. And someone who is at risk of or has severe disease will be given TPOX. Um, the placebo group um, would be different. Any patient with a presumptive or confirmed MPOX can be referred. So you can refer someone while their lab test is still pending. Participants will be compensated for participation and followed throughout the study. So if they were given placebo initially and severe symptoms develop, they will be given TPOX. So all of these um, important speaking notes can be found on this one page guide for patients and providers that was developed with CalPTC and CDPH together. It's found on the CalPTC webpage and can be posted in clinics um, with tear off um, pieces at the bottom to the stomp phone number as well. So we're really trying to help promote the STOMP trial in hopes that we can get this medication um, possibly FDA approved or at least learn more about it for potential future commercial availability. Um, next slide. So the second option of receiving TPOX right now is through the CDC or the state. Um, the state still has storehouse supplies. Um, to access these, you would work through your local health department um, to fill out a TPOX TPOX request form. So you would reach out to your, on the right here, the local medical health operational area coordinator, the MOAC, um, and that list can be found at the link at the bottom. Um, each area has their own MOAC. The MOAC would then send you the TPOX request form, which you would fill out and denote whether or not you um, filled out the CDC IND registry in the past. As long as you have, you meet criteria to receive TPOX at your clinic. And the LHJ um, MOAC will review that form, send it to the state warehouse and process the form. As long as no issues, you would receive TPOX in 24 to 48 hours. Next slide. So as a review, um, STOMP, easy to enroll patients, it's incentivized, remote options are available for patients. Um, it's needed for future FDA approval. So please educate your patients about STOMP. They can also enroll with mild disease. State supplies, um, you would fill out a resource request form from your MOAC and you would receive medication through CDPH Warehouse. Um, patients in this category do need to have severe disease or be at risk for severe disease um, progression. And service announcement is that an enhanced HPOP 
reporting for TPOX is coming soon. Um, this would be similar to how you report for COVID medications and Genios vaccine is my understanding. Um, so we will be requesting providers to start to update their inventories through the enhanced HPOP. If any questions, um, please contact the MPX treatment at cdph.cal.gov. We'd love to hear any TPOX related questions. And next slide, I will hand it off to Kayla. Thank you all. Thanks, Jess. Um, so talking a little bit about MPOX vaccination. So a quick overview, Genius vaccine is approved for the prevention of MPOX and of smallpox. It reduces transmission and prevents severe disease, and it can be given up to 14 days after exposure as well. Given adequate Genios supply, vaccines Vaccine providers can offer the vaccine to any patients who may be at risk, and persons who request vaccination should receive it with, without having to attest to specific risk factors. And um, we have a link here about CDPH's recommendation for shared decision making with patients on route of administration. And as far as accessing vaccines and reporting MPOX vaccinations, providers can access the vaccine by enrolling in My California Vax and contacting their local health department, um, reporting doses to the California Immunization Registry or CARE is also required, and adverse, adverse events reporting is possible through VAERS, the Vaccine Adverse Event Reporting System. And Genios, as I mentioned briefly, is effective against disease acquisition and severity. So observational studies of Genios vaccine effectiveness against MPOX have ranged from 66% to 89% for two doses and 36% to 75% for one dose. And we also recently published an MMWR looking at um, severity and odds of hospitalization by vaccination status. So MPOX cases who were unvaccinated were three times more likely to be hospitalized due to MPOX um, than those who received two doses of Genios. And among HIV positive persons with MPOX who are in, at increased risk for severe MPOX disease, those who were vaccinated had lower odds of hospitalization than did those who were unvaccinated. So there were actually no hospitalizations reported among persons with HIV who had had two doses of Genios um, in California. And these findings underscore the benefit of um, receiving both doses to persons with HIV infection. And um, there's also an MMWR published um, looking at series completion for Genios and looking at route of administration. So series completion of Genios is similar irrespective of the route of administration. Um, and you can see the figure here demonstrating that as well. And um, that same MMWR looked also at disparities in two dose series completion, and they were noted among persons assigned female sex at birth, certain racial and ethnic groups and younger persons. So some strategies for improving second dose uptake include encouraging patients to complete the two-dose Genios vaccination series and contacting patients overdue for their second dose, particularly in groups with the lowest odds of series completion, such as persons age 18 to 24. And we included the link to that MMWR in this presentation as well. Focused outreach, culturally sensitive messaging, and direct engagement by trusted messengers to groups dispropor disproportionately represented in MPOX cases, such as Black and Latinx persons, like we showed earlier. Um, and then looking at MPOX and people with past infection or a complete vaccination course, a global case series. So this was published in September in the Lancet. Um, there's been a total, there was a total of seven reinfections, 29, 29 post-vaccination infections, and one case with both reinfection and vaccination. So the takeaway here is to maintain ongoing clinical suspicion for MPOX infections for at-risk individual, individuals, even if um, they've already been infected or if they are vaccinated. Reinfection and post-vaccine infections are possible. And in California, there have been approximately 100 post-vaccine infections. And CDPH and CDC are interested in hearing about your reinfection cases as well. 
So key takeaways um, for the whole presentation, MPOX is still present and cases are on the rise across California and they continue to rise. MPOX mimics other diseases and vice versa. So have a low threshold to test for MPOX along with other STIs. Reinfection and post-vaccination infections are possible. Test for HIV in MPOX cases and monitor HIV patients with MPOX closely. Risk of se severe disease in persons with CD4 count below 350. Start treatment early and reinstitute natural immune response. HCPs should wear PPE during MPOX suspect interactions. Testing training shared today. Um, we're also interested to hear any barriers um, that anyone has encountered with testing for MPOX. And as far as vaccination, Genios vaccination reduces the risk of case acquisition and severe disease. All persons at risk for MPOX should be vaccinated with the full two dose series, but those with HIV should be of highest priority. And currently in California, vaccine coverage among people with HIV is below 30%. Vaccinated persons can still be infected with MPOX and should be tested and may have more mild symptoms compared to unvaccinated persons. And treatment with symptomatic management is crucial. STOMP is open for mild symptoms, it's easy to enroll, and C CDC, IND, EUA, and state supplies for severe disease, possibility of severe disease is available as well. And we also have some resources and um, these slides will be sent out so you'll have access um, to these various links and resources. And then here are citations. Um, and I think that's, that's all we have, right, Jeff? Yes. Um, go back to the thank you, I think. I just wanted to give special thanks, oh, yeah. uh, acknowledgements. Um, these slides were adapted by Dr. Kelly Johnson um, from CDPH and UCSF. The case pictures um, from all the contributors around the state. Again, we really appreciate that. And um, the CDPH impacts immunization branch, the Office of AIDS, the EPI um, disease investigation and clinical team. Thank you all for contributing to these slides. Um, so that concludes our presentation and we're happy to open to the Q&A. Great, thank you so much, Jessica and Kayla. Um, that was a great presentation with a lot of information, certainly concerning that there's increasing cases of MPOX that are happening, but a lot of information that was shared in ways to make sure that we are uh, diagnosing um, uh, and treating and preventing um, MPOX. Uh, so thank you, uh, Dr. Watson. So uh, we do have um, time today to go through uh, questions. And so we encourage folks to enter in uh, questions in the Q&A and we will um, get to them as we can. There are a number of questions that have already been answered um, in the Q&A. Um, and uh, we might be able to have some time to highlight some of those as well live. Um, but uh, maybe one of the first questions I can go to uh, which is maybe a question for um, Dr. Watson. Um, it would be great to highlight that healthcare providers who are likely to do testing are recommended to get vaccinated. Um, and also that there's no circumstance where biopsy or using a razor or needle for unroofing the lesion is needed for testing. It's kind of a question and a comment. <laughs> yeah, um, so, I may hand off to our immunization branch about testing um, for health, or sorry, healthcare providers that are testing to get vaccinated. I think there's mixed reviews and the AICP just gave an update where this population um, isn't as at as much risk as say lab workers. Um, so we're working on that answer, um, but for the, circumstance where biopsy or using a razor needle is needed. So there's not really a circumstance where biopsy or using a razor needle um, should be needed. The DNA should be on the outside of the lesion. Um, that's what's recommended at least is to avoid any razors or needles um, and swab the lesion um, vigorously to collect DNA. So you shouldn't have to use sharps to get testing. Um, and let's come back to the healthcare provider answer. We can answer in the chat or if 
um, Luis or Tarek are able to come off mute, they could answer that live. It seems like um, they might have be, have some problems coming off mute, but um, maybe uh, uh, okay, we we'll can help support that. But um, um, we can move on to the next question then. Um, so, what is the recommendation um, for uh, Genio's vaccination for patients who are unvaccinated and had previous MPOX infection and recovered from it? Sure, I can answer that one. Um, so people who have been previously infected by MPOX are not currently recommended for vaccination. Um, I think we don't have enough studies to show that it would be helpful. They should have enough immunity, um, but more studies to come in the future. The current recommendation is if you've been infected with MPOX, you do not need vaccination. Great, thank you. Um, so uh, the next question, um, um, what is the recommendation for persons who um, have tested positive for MPOX um, but have uh, never been vaccinated? I guess that sort of relates to your uh, uh, previous question. So um, to answer that one, um, Here's another question. I haven't read the CDC paper on antiviral resistance yet, but curious, do we know whether observed mutations correlate with phenotypic resistance by culture? Yeah, this is a, a great and really interesting question. Um, we have our VRDL lab specialist on the call too um, that can help us answer that question. Um, let me reread it. So yeah, Jill Hacker would have a great response to this that I'm not gonna do um, justice to. And okay. I'm gonna Sarah go ahead and ask Jill to speak yeah. again. Um, Perfect, thanks. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you now. Great, thank you. So the question was whether or not the mutations have been shown phenotypically to be associated with resistance. And they were able to demonstrate that different levels of resistance for her, some of the mutations that they were able to analyze. Um, I haven't, you know, I don't know. It's a, a varying levels of resistance, and there is a the table two, which if you can access that EID preprint, um, gives a fair amount of information in it as to which mutations have been associated with varying degrees of resistance. Some patients have more than one mutation that appears to be associated with resistance to TPOX. The challenge is, of course, that there are no laboratories in the United States that are doing sequencing and looking at uh, mutations in the gene that encodes for the protein for which TPOX is targeted. And none of that sequencing work is done diagnostically. So even though we are assessing samples as they come as to what their mutations may be, uh, those details can't be shared back with clinicians and can't be used to guide patient management. Uh, but yes, the answer is some of those mutations seem to have a high, confer a high level of resistance. What I would say is the good news is that we don't seem to see those strains being passed around within the community. I'll stop there. Thank you so much, Bill, for your um, expertise in answering that question. Um, I'm not sure if uh, Luis or Tark have an ability to come off mute yet, um, but... Uh, they do. Okay, great. So maybe we can circle back to the question about um, healthcare uh, providers um, needing or not needing uh, vaccination for MPOX, if uh, you like to... Comment about that, maybe Luis? 
Sure, sure. So yes, yeah, so healthcare providers who um, are collecting samples um, for MPOX testing are not uh, recommended to get vaccination. Um, the risk is thought to be very low in those situations, um, especially when uh, PPE, appropriate PPE is being used. Um, there is a MMWR uh, regarding the use of Genius vaccine for occupational, potential occupational exposure, which maybe I can put in the chat or something. I'm not sure what technologically we can do at this moment. Um, but really the recommendations for occupational exposure are for people who work with vaccinia viruses in the lab and in certain public health um, workers or responders. Um, but just keep in mind that um, Genios vaccine was really, um, you know, initially meant to be used in response to um, a bioterrorism um, attack uh, with smallpox vaccine. So when they're talking about responders, it's really in the context of people who would be potentially ex responding in that situation, not really for um, managing uh, potential MPOX patients in a clinic. If that makes sense. Great, thank you so much, Louise. Um, and if, uh, yeah, um, it maybe if you, I don't know if you can post the resource in the chat, but um, you can also send it to me and I can put it in the chat if needed. Um, so uh, another question is um, what about, uh, you know, and this is a question that comes up a lot, I think, um, is there a need for a booster dose for people who are fully vaccinated or already received? Um, two doses of the vaccine. Okay. At and this, yeah, at this, there's no recommendation for a booster dose. Um, there was just a meeting with the advisory committee on immunization practices that we listened to yesterday. There are studies that are ongoing now to determine the um, the duration of immunity. Um, the current occupational guidance recommends a booster every two years, but I learned yesterday that the two-year recommendation is basically because no one has looked um, at immunity longer than two years, so there's no reason to think that it wouldn't last longer, but we'll have more um, information soon um, as that study is, is currently, they're currently collecting data um, up to five years after vaccination, um, but at this time, there is no recommendation for um, booster doses after people receive their two dose of primary series. Great, thank you, Elise. And it's sort of a related question. Um, I'm not sure if we'll have the answer to this, but are there any current benchmarks for immunity post vaccination? Which is, are there any titers available or information about that that might um, let us understand if, if someone has appropriate immunity um, or waiting immunity? Ooh, that might be a question for Jill. <laughs> I don't, I'm not, yeah, I'm not sure if uh, there's a correlate of immunity. I'm oh, sorry, just... I missed the question. So the question was about um, if there's any sort of current benchmarks for immunity post vaccination or any titers available or information of that that might help support that. I'm not aware of whether that has been looked at yet. Okay, thank you. Um, um, another question that just came in, um, it, um, I guess the vaccine efficacy data was presented, um, was assessed how long after the vaccination? Um, I guess, um, yeah, maybe, and this is maybe some data that uh, Kayla had presented, but um, maybe uh, you can answer this question, Kayla. Yeah, so um, it varied the, um, the time, the vaccine efficacy data for severity, I believe is what you're referring to, and I can drop the MMWR in the chat as well. Um, so you can read it, but it varied. So we, um, it was all, 
persons who were any case that we considered fully vaccinated would have had to have been 14 days past their second dose. Um, or one dose vaccinated would have had to be 14 days past their first dose without a second dose. Um, so, but the time after vaccination varied, but those were how we defined vaccination status for that analysis. Thank you, Kayla. Um, another question, um, can individuals be vaccinated for both MPOX and flu on the same day? Yes. <laughs> yeah, you can co-administer um, MPOX vaccine with with um, any other vaccine. The only um, kind of stipulation, and it's it's not a contraindication or a precaution, but it's just sort of like um, something to think about, is um, there is a concern with previous versions of the MPOX vaccine that may cause pericarditis or myopericarditis. We have not seen that with the Genios vaccine, um, but just something to think about when vaccinating young men with COVID vaccine and with MPOX, because we know that that age group is uh, at higher risk for myocarditis with COVID vaccine. So um, you could consider you know, uh, uh, using those two vaccines about a month apart. Um, but it's just like a consideration. It's not a contraindication or a precaution to vaccination. Thank you, Elise. Um, um, there are, are currently, oh, well, um, maybe there's a clarifying question that's sort of about to come in, but um, no other questions right now. I'll, I'll give it maybe another minute um, for folks to submit additional questions. While we're reading the um, link to the patient and provider one pager um, for STOMP for clinics, um, the link is down today, but bookmark that link because we're uploading um, translations in Spanish and Chinese which is probably happening right now why the link is down. So that should come up later today. Um, and in general, the californiaptc.com slash resources has a lot of helpful resources on MPOX as well. Great, thanks, Jess. Um, so one thing, this is a question that was answered in the chat, but just wanted to highlight this because um, I think this is probably something a lot of clinics are facing. So um, one uh, attendee had um, mentioned that in their clinic, for a variety of reasons, um, they can't always follow the strict prevention control guidelines that were presented, and um, we're wondering if they should refer the patient elsewhere for evaluation, or if we suspect um, MPOX, or you know, just do the best that we can with the resources they have. Um, the California Prevention Training Center actually developed a really great resource um, for this, and um, provides more pra you know practical tips for preventing MPOX transmission in an outpatient setting. Um, that has been implemented in many sexual health clinics during the outbreak. And so when it gives sort of um, uh, some recommendations when space and resources are scarce or limited and sort of give guidance, real world strategies to allow uh, for clinics um, to still care for patients with MPOX or suspected MPOX um, as safely and effectively as possible. And if I see uh, Jess, just put that in the chat as well. Um, another question just came in, um, probably for the vaccine team. Um, are there any efforts to develop a vaccine specifically for MPOX? No. <laughs> no, I mean, um, the, my understanding is that smallpox and MPOX are sufficiently, um, similar that there wouldn't be any need to have a different vaccine. And in, in fact, um, part of the thinking about why we're having MPOX outbreaks now is when people stopped getting vaccinated for smallpox, um, the 
smallpox vaccine was um, you know, suppressing mpox. Those people weren't getting mpox, but now that people don't get vaccinated for smallpox anymore, that allowed um, mpox disease to kind of get a foothold. So there wouldn't really, there wouldn't be a need to have a separate vaccine. Thank you, Louise. Um, seeing another question that came in. So we navigated the outbreak in California with both intradermal and um, sub-Q doses of vaccine. Previously studied immunogenicity suggested the routes had similar immunogenicity. We have had some patients come back and ask for two sub-Q doses. We have offered to complete the series with um, two doses, regardless of route. Um, not sure that's much of a question um, or just sort of a comment, but I don't know if the vaccination team has anything that they would like to add to that. I know you've looked at it, um, sort of uh, uh, um, the efficacy or uh, between the two types of administration before. So maybe yeah. you have something to comment on. Yeah, there's been no difference found between the efficacy with route of administration. So um, it kind of doesn't really matter what combinations of people had two cups of Q or two intradermal or one of each, um, they're good to go. They don't need to um, repeat or get additional doses. Great, thank you, Luis. Um, I'm also going to put in the chat the MMWR for use of um, Genios in occupational settings in the chat that um, Lisa mentioned earlier. Okay, we do have some time for more questions. I'll give it maybe a few more seconds for any other questions that people might be typing in the Q and A. Okay, seeing no more questions, then oh, actually, just one just jumped, uh, uh, came, came right in. So curious, the current cost of MPOX testing, could that be a barrier to testing? Um, Jill, do you happen to know this? I, I don't know about cost of testing. It's an interesting question. Most public health laboratories do not charge for testing. I am not aware of whether Quest or ARUP or any of the large commercial laboratories that do testing, whether or not they um, impose a charge for that. But certainly public health laboratories and there's capacity at many of them um, do not typically charge for testing. I will add to this question that we are very interested to hear if there are any barriers to testing. Um, we're trying to help eliminate any barriers. So please feel free to reach out um, if you have come across them so that we can learn. Thank you, Justin, Jill. And definitely, yes, any sort of barriers that we may, um, uh, you are, um, you're seeing um, on the ground, definitely let us know and we can um, try to address those. Um, another question, uh, do you have information on MPOX trends in other countries? Uh, maybe this question for Kayla. You know, there's been some increases in, noted in um, even currently in China, I believe, but um, I'll let Kayla um, answer 
that question. Yeah, so um, there have, like you said, Eric, been um, some increases in several Asian countries. Um, I can I can provide a more thorough answer in the chat. I don't want to miss misrepresent anything, so I'll respond shortly. Great, thanks, Kayla. All right, no more questions on the Q and A. There was a thank you to to everyone on the uh, the speakers and the the people on the panel answering the questions. Um, So with that, then I guess we can wrap up today a little bit early. Um, I want to uh, give a huge thanks to um, Kayla and, and Jessica for um, presenting the information today on MPOX epidemiology and clinical management. Um, and again, thanks to everyone who on the panel who has been able to answer questions and appreciate everyone's interest in this. This is um, certainly we, as, I, as you've heard that there are increasing cases and we think it's you know, it's important for people to keep MPOX um, um, on the top of their mind as part of the differential diagnosis. Um, and um, and uh, uh, again, well, there'll be a, a survey that is sent out um, um, within 24 hours um, uh, to get continuing medical education. Um, actually, one other thing that we do want to include, and I, I mentioned this earlier in the chat, is that um, we this sort of separately from the um, CME requirements, um, there is a survey that uh, we would like to share with healthcare providers about um, assessing sort of their um, MPOX uh, technical assistance needs. Um, hoping maybe uh, Jess, you can put that in the chat, or um, um, someone on the team can put that in the chat. And um, this is going to uh, allow us to know sort of uh, what sort of technical assistance we can. Um, provide uh, to the clinics across California um, related to MPOX and can even um, do individual TA requests as needed if you um, include your contact information at the end of the survey. Um, so maybe we can just want to make sure that gets in the chat before we end for the day. Uh, just, yep, so, yeah, great. Perfect. Great, yeah. So, just, just put that in the chat. So again, um, it'd be great, especially since we're ending a little bit early, if you have time to complete that survey, to give your thoughts about um, sort of your uh, needs and your, the clinics that you work at, and that would be really great. And again, it's a, a different survey from what you'll be sent out um, within 24 hours to get credit for CME. Great, well, thank you. I guess we can close for today. Appreciate everyone's attention and uh, Hope you all have a good rest of your day. Thank you all.